storm water it does tend to sheet flow uh, in a westerly direction. Um, and we've sized those based on a DEP standard for Chapter 500. And those are shown, and those will be deed uh, restricted and, and uh, put into the recorded documents. Uh, it was asked about three intermittent streams uh, along this boundary line, and we've shown those in a fairly heavy black line. They don't really come onto the property. They kind of originate here and head in a sort of a northwesterly direction. Uh, the 75-foot setback um, from the uh, perennial stream <coughs> comes underneath uh, Mitchell Hill Road and comes across the corner. I, I, I felt like we had the, uh, the setback shown properly or, or clearly, and it did not impact uh, any of the buildable area for Lot 9. Of course, Lot 9 exceeds the 30,000 square feet uh, that's required, and also the frontages uh, exceed what, what we've uh, been required. Uh, so again, the uh, proposed buffers on the rear will be bordered by mapped wetland. Uh, this buffer will provide the protection of the wetland well in excess of the 25 foot uh, that is, is uh, mandated by the ordinance. And we will uh, mark these with um, buffer pins with uh, red caps that say buffer no disturb. That's a DEP requirement uh, if this did uh, require a permit from them. So that's what we'd like to do on the backs of those lots to give the homeowner a reference point of, of no disturbance and, and don't, don't go any further. Uh, we have added to the uh, note number four on the plans the start and completion date of the peer review and the original uh, wetland review was added to that. Uh, the consultant completed the work, wetland and vernal pool, vernal pool has prepared an additional memo which is in your packet and uh, Alexander will speak to that in, in a minute. Uh, we've had, we were asked to expand note 20 which uh, details the open space use and uh, we have a homeowner's uh, doc in draft form from the attorneys. Uh, those will be those documents will be submitted uh, prior to the next uh, <coughs> appearance. Uh, we've talked about shared driveways. The only shared driveway will, between, will be between lots five and six, given how the existing location of that driveway comes across. All the lots will have uh, their own driveway with a turnaround uh, on site so that nobody's backing out onto Mitchell Hill Road. And all the driveways of site distance was discussed uh, at length with um, peer review for traffic engineering. We've reviewed those, we've shown them on the plan, and just in the last um, review, they asked to, um, to review the site distance heading to the north from lot nine. And I did that, uh, it's about 500 feet, so it certainly exceeds the requirement of 305 feet, which the traffic engineers have outlined. Uh, we had a detail added to the uh, de uh, plan sheet, was an inlet protection culvert, a riprap detail. Uh, just some things that we wanted to make sure we understood is that the, uh, <coughs> each lot owner will be responsible for paying the recreational fee. Uh, the applicant has agreed to uh, put a fire tank. Uh, and we've been working with the fire department trying to uh, establish the best location. And I think what we've come up with is it'll be in the area of the common line of six and seven, just downhill from the uh, existing house that's there. Um, they really weren't, they didn't really, I won't say they didn't care, but they didn't really have a preference. We do have a detail of what that'll look like with the dry hydrant uh, on the uh, side of the road with the property on the west side of the uh, Mitchell Hill Road. Uh, we've added all the standard uh, notes, as you can see, copious notes here, which are the standard uh, approval notes to be ready for final approval. Uh, during the comment period last, uh, the last meeting, uh, there was a talk about water availability, water quality. Um, we did get a letter from a well driller, which is part of the packet, uh, stating actual uh, history and evidence of uh, drilling wells in this area. Uh, the existing house on lot six has adequate water quality and quantity. And we also reviewed the main geological survey map and there's an eight and a half by 11 in your submission packet. <clears throat> by the dots and on your eight and a half by 11 they're yellow uh, or it's color coded uh, based on the yield of the wells. So this is the main geological uh, website. Uh, 
these wells, and again, our site is here. There's an assortment of wells that were drilled with a yield anywhere from four to 10 or 15 gallons per minute. There was even one well uh, that was like 25 to 40 gallons per minute, which you could, uh, you could serve a lot of homes with that. So we, we feel like we've, um, with testimony and the letter, we feel like we've, uh, we've accomplished uh, you know, the responses that the board asked for. Um, we did receive another uh, review memo from uh, planning office that had a half a dozen items here. Um, as we just talked about the stormwater, how that's gonna be handled, we will meet the chapter 419 post-construction stormwater ordinance. Limits on disturbance on the buffers. Uh, again, I talked about the, uh, the method of uh, pins with buffer caps uh, to indicate a limit of what uh, the lot can, um, can handle for clearing and any disturbance. Stormwater buffers that will be deed restricted and recorded in the Registry of Deeds. Uh, the 75 foot setback, it says from intermittent stream, I think it just meant the perennial, because these intermittent streams out here, there are no setback issues. And again, I can, I can talk to the planning office on that to see if we need to um, just increase that notice uh, that it's available there. Uh, open space homeowners docs, as I said, and they were brought up in this uh, memo here, they will be submitted, they're in a draft form. Site distances were measured correctly, just my memo referenced the wrong eye height and vehicle height, but it was a two and a half foot eye height and a 4.25 vehicle height. And all the site distance that were asked for exceed uh, what would be required. Uh, water supply, again, with the evidence with the letter and the, from the Maine Geological Society uh, maps that I have here. Uh, I'm gonna ask Alexander Finnamore uh, from VHB to come up and just uh, uh, talk a little bit uh, to close out my uh, sub submission and presentation and then We'll go with questions from there. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, good evening. Uh, my name is uh, Alex Fenoir. I'm an environmental scientist with VHB Inc. in South Portland. Um, I'm a cert certified wetland scientist in New Hampshire and a licensed site evaluator in Maine. I, uh, just give you a little background since I'm probably a fresh face to all of you. Uh, I graduated from the University of Rhode Island with a Bachelor's of Science in Environmental Science and Management with a focus on wetland ecology. I have 13 years of experience as an environmental consultant, of which a majority of the time has been spent in the field delineating wetlands and performing over 1,000 uh, vernal pool surveys throughout New England. Um, I am an active member of the Maine Association of Wetland Scientists and have served on its executive committee as, sec as secretary and helped draft and provide comments representing this organization during the development of the vernal pool regulations under uh, the Maine Department of Environmental Protection's Chapter 335 Significant Wildlife Habitat Rules. Um, on August 25th, uh, 2017, I performed the wetland delineation on site. Um, and although the wetland delineation is not completed during the vernal pool indicator species breeding period, which is typically in April, which as we pointed out is coming right up, um, or could be even sooner this year with uh, the, the proposed uh, weather coming up here, but uh, uh, I conducted a, a thorough investigation looking for um, any depressions that might have sufficient hydro period uh, to support breeding populations of uh, vernal pool indicator species. Evidence of such areas typically includes standing water or depressions with uh, water stained leaves that may contain standing water for a brief time during the spring. Uh, I observed no such depressions during this time. I again visited the site on November 24th um, in response to the comments received by the Cumberland County Soils and Water Conservation District's peer review and again thoroughly investigated the site for wetlands water bodies and potential vernal pool depressions and again found none. Therefore, I would kindly ask the planning board at this time to consider waiving the need for the spring vernal, time, uh, vernal pool survey. It is my professional opinion that there are not any areas on this site that could even support habitat for vernal pool indicator species as defined by both the Maine DEP and the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers. Thank you. Mr. Chairman, I got one more. Uh point to uh, just to outline here. Uh, there was a letter from Wallace Fengler, uh, who's in a butter out in the back, and uh, Pat Donahue spoke to him at length um, over the weekend. And you know he's, he's got some concerns in there, and I think some of them are, are what we're addressing tonight. Uh, and I think 
from what Pat said, one of his biggest concerns is what's going to happen to that land out in the back. I mean, he, he abuts it, and uh, Pat said, well, it's got to stay as open space. It can't be developed, which I think pleased him. And also, uh, this discussion that's going to continue with him about maybe putting this and maybe some of his land in a conservation easement to just, uh, set. that's kind of what he was concerned about and looking at. So that dialogue's ongoing, and I think, you know, the other issues that Mr. Fengler had, uh, I think we've, we've uh, spoken to them tonight. But that's where that stands. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, we are going to have some public comment on this this evening, so at this time I'd like to open it up for any public comment that's here. Please remember to state your name, your address, and try to contain it to five minutes and not be repetitive. Thank you. My name is Kenneth Fengler. I'm Wally Fengler's son, just as a side note on the conversation. Um, my dad is traveling time, so I may comment to that letter in a few seconds. Um, my address is 6 Mitchell Hill Road in Scarborough, Maine. Um, I did speak at the last meeting about water quality concerns, wells and whatnot, I, and I was curious if, if it's out there for discussion, was the name of the well driller, and I don't have the packets that you have in front of you. We do have the names of the well, the well driller, yes. You might, I mean, is it one of the hillocks, or? Yes. Okay. Stanley, uh, well, Joe Gallant. Joe Gallant, okay. Um, <clears throat> so I do reckon, I do see some changes in the plan, which I think is a beneficial, you know, I noticed the um, change in lot six, and I think, and I certainly see the uh, um, buffer indicators at the back of the lots. And I think those are both improvements. I think myself and some of the others that have spoke at the last uh, meeting still probably feel most of the concern with reference to um, compact development and and its ex and its uh, influence on the nature, rural nature of the of the roadway. I do still recognize that we are setting off a great deal of open space, and I think that that is, um, you know, agreeable to everyone. I do sort of feel that the shared driveway that exists between lot six and lot five um, might be alleviated if if we were to look at perhaps um, consolidating. You know, you know it, where things are the most dense is between lots one, two, three, four, and five, and perhaps if we were looking at you know eight lots instead of nine, that might help preserve the spacing, uh, approximate a little bit more the rural nature of the of the development, you know, and alleviate the uh, concern of shared driveways. I do appreciate that we um, the applicant has. Uh, assured and acknowledged that each driveway will have its own turnaround. That was a concern that I had expressed at the last meeting and to make sure that people that would be occupying these homes in the future would be entering Mitchell Hill Road going forward. Um, I think one of the concerns that myself um, that I have and one of my other neighbors who was in, unable to be here tonight had, had asked about was sort of the general stewardship of the open space in the future. Will that be part of the a homeowners association? Was there discussion about whether this land would be um, passed to the land trust or, or what sort of um, oversight, I guess, would there be of the open space? Um, those are really only my, my comments and, and questions. Thank you. Thank you. We have anyone else from the public that would like to speak? Seeing none, I'm going to close public comment. And we'll jump right into it. Uh, Rick, you want to start us off? Uh, I'm glad to see that some of the public's earlier comments were addressed by the applicant. That was nice. Um, there was one item in the letter from Mr. Frangle that I, that I wanted to ask about was the, um, the well exclusion zone on 8 and 9. Extend across Mitchell Road. Um, is it? Did they? They don't go into. Do they cross into the lots across the street or just across the road? Do you know? 
it's probably just uh, looking at the scale. I mean, you must have, you, you saw this knowing the door. So. I, I did, and I, and I think my, my response wasn't uh, in writing. I think when you get this 100-foot uh, separation, I don't think you get beyond the IHO right away. Okay. So these lots up here are fine. We, we can double check that. Yeah, no, I, I wanted, I'd like to make sure that they don't go on sure. else's yeah. loft. Yeah, I don't think they do. Okay. Yeah. I mean, if, if, that's fine. That's, yeah. that's would be my if, if we had to, we could slide the septic system a little bit further onto the lot now, and make that make that uh, distance yeah. secure. Okay. Okay. Um, and then there was there. I know that uh, the gentleman who talked about the vernal pools. Maybe he would be the one to speak to this. But we were missing some streams and stuff last time, right? So, has it been fully delineated? Every all the streams have been identified. I believe there was a stream crossing through lot one that wasn't on the uh, map last time. Or maybe yeah, I can speak to that. That was a stream. With the uh, my, with my first delineation back in August. Um, oh, neat. Um, the back property line that I that I was provided with came more like this. So I wasn't I wasn't aware that these streams were even on the property at the time. So that's why I came back after the uh, uh, conservation, uh, the soil, uh, the Cumberland County Soil and Water Conservation Commission had a comment that uh, the, some streams had been missed. That's why I came back in November to get those streams. So are we confident that all the streams have been identified and all the setbacks are met? Uh, I, I'm confident they've all been identified. I can speak to the setbacks, but, but I, I believe they have. And just in terms of the setbacks, I think the only thing that we couldn't quite tell is on lot one, and as you said, it's the perennial stream. There's just a lot of layers, so it's hard to tell where that 75 foot setback line. Which lot was that? I think it was lot one. Oh, lot nine, I'm sorry. Yeah. In, the, in the very uh, nor northerly corner of it, right? It's just hard to tell. There's just, there were, as I said, there's a lot of layers on it. It was hard to tell. It's a matter of feet, if it is. Um, yeah. So we just want to. It is out of the building, but I can, I can, uh, you know, improve that uh, designation, delineation. All right. Um, yeah, as long as they're all been identified, there's not anything running right across. Well, I mean, you can get a permit by rule, I'm sure, if you have to. Yeah, we uh, we could, but we, we won't need to. So, thank you. Yeah. All right. Um, and then I guess I think the intent was to. Well, I'm not sure what the intent is. But if the intent is to sell these as lots, how are we going to guarantee that each driveway has a turnaround? Is it going to be the deed? How well, is it going to work? It, it'll be a condition of approval. And so code enforcement, upon granting a building permit or an occupancy permit, All right. uh, the driveway needs to show a, a turnaround. OK, that sounds yeah. good. I like that. Um, yeah, and then uh, and the existing house, um, it, you said it already. It has a good producing well and a, a septic. You're not. There's there's no plans to demo that house or anything. That's just going to kind of stay like it it's is right now. Stay correct. Okay. Are you selling that as? A, 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 that it'll, it'll be sold with lot six or as lot six. Okay. Uh, when this is approved. Okay. Yeah, that's. That's all. Thank you, Rick. Uh, Richard. I, I actually don't have any more questions. Um, I'm comfortable with the assessment on the vernal pools. I'm familiar with the University of Rhode Island, and they have quality programs. So I'm um, comfortable with a graduate from URI. Uh, and uh, I have no more questions. Thank you. Okay. Uh, the only question I have is um, on the wells, because that was a big topic last time you were here. Sure. And I, I have a document from Mr. Hillock, or his representative, saying there's no problem. And there was another, there was another document saying there, that there, is there another one confirming that? There is a document from the Maine Geological Survey. Okay, so, so we're satisfied that there's not a problem with the wells for a while? Is that another high question? <laughs> That's a boring you have, question. You have information provided to us that states there, is, there should not be a problem with the wells. That is a hard question. Yeah. So, yeah, the information has been provided. The standard is uh, to the effect of uh, the applicant should provide evidence that there's suitable uh, uh, capacity for water, water supply. Okay. All right. Um, I have no other questions then. Thank you. 
Um, yeah, I, I was glad to see that you've done a lot of uh, cleanup since the last presentation. It looks like pretty good. Um, I, I am going to ask the board specifically to comment on whether or not um, how you, your your opinion on the waiver request from the applicant on a vernal pool assessment, whereas it might be, you know, we still ha we're in a position now where you can still provide a preliminary approval this evening have that study conducted before they show up for a final approval and have that information in hand and just want some feedback from the board in general as to whether or not it's, it's worth the exercise in your opinion to have that done uh, at all. The applicant is preferring not to. I think uh, we as a board and a town probably might, might, I think staff would enjoy seeing one, not because it makes them happy, but because <laughs> yeah. um, you got to check a box. I mean, you really do on some of the stuff. So, um, can, can I ask a question to Angela to, to clarify my answer to you? Sure. Um, if there's a vernal pool and it's in the open space, would it affect the current proposal? Well, I think that goes back to what Nick was saying that um, if you do it in between, before final, if they found one, it might have impact say a lot or, or how they might lose a lot or something like that because of the ring that that comes out around oh, the because of the pool. radius the no build radius around the vernal pool well yeah the, the the zone of impact or whatever around the vernal pool so um that's how it would impact the final the final subdivision plan or it could So whenever anyone's ready to offer some feedback on that, <laughs> I'll I'll, uh, I'll go out and say it. Uh, I, I think it's worth the exercise. Um, and you know, can we limit it to the the lots? I mean, I think that's probably where Rick was going with that question, um, or at least you know within the seventy five feet of the stream setback lot. Is well, there is there a way to limit a, it? A vernal pool has a, a larger. Has a larger range. range that that yeah, and that's why they're important. What is the size? Because it can impact. And I guess I would ask maybe their what, so what like how that would so impact. There's, there's two. There's well, yeah, it's in, I'm sure. Better. What is the yeah. what is the size of the setback around a vernal pool? Okay, that, that's a that could I could go on for a long time yeah. about that, but I'll try to <laughs> narrow it down. Um, so uh, according to the Maine Department of Environmental Protection, there's a 250 foot uh, jurisdictional buffer around a, a, a vernal pool that is determined a significant vernal pool, which meets certain criteria, um, generally uh, abundance of certain species, um, and then the Army Corps of Engineers has a 750 foot. Um, uh, radius, but that is only triggered if you impact wetlands, and this this project does not impact any wetlands, so it wouldn't even go there. Uh, one point I, I would like to bring up, um, either either way on your decision, is um, if if there what I'm just hypothetically speaking here, there, there's a vernal pool um, somewhere in the on the open space. Um, I'd like to point out that. Lots nine through five are all in cleared areas um, to begin with, and when you when you de when you're dealing with Maine Department of um, Environmental Protection, they're within their 250 foot radius. They're looking at area that um, has not been cleared yet, and all those lots are, are fields, so they be considered developed. Um, just food for thought. So in the in the sense the real the real study that would impact you would be one through four lots one through four, if there was a pool within two hundred fifty feet, feet, that met significant criteria. I would say give him conditional approval and look for the pool near those lots. And he's he's found no no evidence of any pools up to this point, right? Correct. But he hasn't done anything in the spring when they are correct. Most likely they. I think you should go on and check. I'd like to make one other quick point um, that the, the wetlands for the, those other southern lots, lots one, one through four, um, the wetlands are much, uh, are pretty far downhill, um, as you can see by the topo. And, yeah, and, and, and uh, to be defined as a vernal pool, I'm, I'm sure you, you've all been trained on this or are, are familiar with it, um, it they, they fall within the wetlands. Lots one through four, there are no wetlands. So the wetlands, this is all, if a vernal pool exists, it's in here. Mm -hmm. 
and as I've indicated in my letter and then uh, Alexander, there are no site characteristics. You can't have an inlet or an outlet. It's got to be a, a contained depression uh, in a wetland area, and none were found prior to snow. So are you looking for a motion or a Looking for feedback as to whether or not the applicant's request for a waiver to any vernal pool study. Okay, just to get the, the, the discussion going, I would, I would, I would be willing to waive that for those lots one through four. You're waiving for lots one through four. Yeah, for a, a vernal pool okay. study. And five through nine are well, fields. Like he, like and he says it, it's just a field anyway. It's like right. it could affect the back property line boundary though. That is that is possible. The wetlands come into the back, or they're along. But the of, back. of lots nine through five, it, you could you could have an impact to the boundary if, line. If there's a vertical pool, but again, you know, in a detailed site walk. So from what I'm hearing from Roger, five through nine would be an area. Of, uh, I'm sorry, six through nine, or five through nine would be the area. Five, five through nine would be the area of study that the board would be interested. In. So no, just no, I'm saying based on what he says, that's. That's basically a field. It's, there's no wooded areas there, right. and it's not likely to be any vernal pools there. Is, isn't that what? Well, it, it, a vernal pool, it, ha it would have to be an undisturbed area, <laughs> right? Which is yeah. one through four. And there's no wetlands on the on these lots. Right. It, it's in it's in the rear. Yeah. Right. So I'm saying, at least as I understand <coughs> what you're saying, um, lots one through four, that those lots are not disturbed. At lots one point. through four are, are, are native, you know, forest, and that's you know, where with that steep slopes <coughs> coming down, there's, there's no, there's no wetland and no, no uh, potential, right. certainly up there. Okay. Um, you know where I stand? No. <laughs> <laughs> no. I got a question. I got a follow-up question for my vernal pool man. Can you come? Around? <laughs> Simple question: Is yep. it possible that there's a vernal pool in that wetland? Within 250 feet of lots one through four. From my two um, surveys, I, I would I, I did not observe one. Hypothetically, there could be, but it, from my uh, again from my two surveys where I I systematically grid walked the whole thing, I did not see any depressions that raise any flags to me. I understand, and, I, and I'm sure you're, you're most likely right. Um, no, I, I understand what you're I'm, 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 And you said in, in April, which is February, March, April, you'd be able to identify if there were, most likely be able to identify if there was a pool in that area within 250 feet of those lots. Correct. The, the, uh, the, 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 according to the main DP and U.S. Army Corps of Engineers, the proper time to do a vernal pool survey is in April while they're breeding. Right. If there's potential for a pool to occur. Okay. Okay. So most likely there isn't a vernal pool within those that. But there's potentially there could be is what he's saying. So if there could be a vernal pool within two hundred and fifty feet of lots one through four, then I would move to give them conditional approval on the entire subdivision with the approval to work on the cleared lots because they've already cleared, so the vernal pool has no bearing on those cleared lots. And then in April, you come back with the information to Jay or Angela, and then they get full approval. Is that going to adversely affect your timeline at all? With what? If we give you conditional approval for the... For the well, I, I, again... Uh, I understand, you know, this concern all over the board here. Uh, you're, you're talking about lots one through four being subject to a vernal pool, and you know the closest wetland from these sites here, you know, that's another that's another two to three to four or five hundred feet from the backs of these lots. So, and the grade on that is you know, anywhere from six to ten percent. Um, and again, you, you need a wetland. So this this area. Is really, to me, pretty safe from any potential. Uh, I understand pretty safe. I understand what you're saying, and I'm yeah. sure you're most likely right. But I would well, I, move to have that have that looked at. So you're you're making a formal motion to 
uh, grant conditional approval uh, pending, well, not pending, but asking the applicant to provide a vernal pool study for lots one through four. Is that yes. your motion? Second. I have, a, I have a, a motion and a second. Is there any discussion? Can I? Or yes. First step, you may. Should, should this get approved, I want to be sure for a point of clarity. When, when we say for lots one through, was it four or five? Four. Four. One through four. We're talking about ensuring that there's no vernal pool within 250 feet or 750 line. feet of the back line. We're not talking about ac on the actual lots themselves. Correct. Okay. So uh, within, within the wetlands, 250, yeah, within yeah, the right. wetlands. Okay. Yeah. I just want to be sure we all. That's where they would be. That, that so, is correct. Yeah. That is your motion. Within 250 feet of the back property line, of what lots one through four. I would say whatever the whatever meets the DEP requirement. Because I don't know, I don't have the DEP requirement right in front of me. But whatever meets the DEP requirement, which is according to my vernal pool man is 250 feet but i don't have that in front of me to write down but i would say that can we give it approval based on the the the, the proof that there is no vernal pool that affects any of the lots and it doesn't have to even we don't even have to name one through four it's if the if the rule is that a cleared lot is not subject to any vernal pool requirements then we can just say that any that the any lot that is affected by a vernal pool be, um, you know, redefined or, or whatever it needs to be. I mean, most likely what we're going to find is that there isn't a vernal pool there, but I think I heard at least once that there could be, and I, I don't think that we can get around that. Um. Is there, I have a little to add to the discussion. I think, um, for better or for worse, um, I think I think we should look at doing the study that um, incorporates all of the lots from 250 uh, feet out. And and if you can find a wetland that's 80 feet away from the back property line in that wetland area, I know it's a cleared area, and they're saying, you know, you know, that, you know we should know. I think that's what it boils down to. We should know if there's a vernal pool anywhere along those back lines. I think limiting the scope of their research is warranted here because it's an enormous piece of property, and we're talking about where their impact will be. I, you know, I don't think it hurts us to get the information, and I don't think it's a whole lot of extra effort for them to gather that information on the five more lots. That's my two cents on the discussion. I'd second that. Well, you have a motion and a second, so we need to vote on the pending motion. So, all in favor of. Unless you want to make an amendment to that motion in the form of your discussion, just putting it down. I could, I could amend. Um, so, and I know you know I will, rules better than I do. I, so. I will motion, I could amend. I was just going to let it fail and then read motion, but okay. <laughs> <laughs> but I don't know if it was going to fail. So, I will make an, uh, a motion to amend um, that we include. Uh, all lots be uh, researched for vernal pools within the 250 foot back lot lines. Um, that's my amended motion. That's my amended motion. I think we're at the board level at this point. I get a second on the amended motion. So, any discussion on the amended motion? No. Okay, I need a vote on the amended motion. All in favor of uh, limiting a vernal pool study to the 250 feet behind property lines one through nine. Thanks. <laughs> All right, four. Uh, okay, so we have now a motion, pen, uh, an amended motion that we can vote on the main motion, which is to provide preliminary approval for uh, the Mitchell Hill, sorry, I want to get the name correct, uh, 48 Mitchell Hill Road uh, development um, with the condition that a vernal pool study be conducted within 250 feet of lots one through nine, the back property one. Is there Second. Uh, we already seconded it. That's the new motion. So, all in favor? There you go. You have a preliminary approval after some light work here. There you go. <laughs> so, good luck. To you. Next item Rock Church requests a site plan amendment for 66 Warren Road, Assessor's Map R58, Lot 19.
Jay or Jamel? Uh, yeah, I think I'll kick this one off. Um, let's see. So this is an application for, as you noted, a site plan amendment to the Rock Church. Um, this property is in the R4 district, and therefore we have a use that we re actually required before coming to this board, going to the Board of Appeals um, for an expansion. Um, so they have received their Board of Appeals a approval uh, for the expansion of the use, and now they are back before this board for site plan approval. Um, I was actually a little surprised to find out that this item had been all the way almost a year ago since this was before the board, which, as I said, a little surprising. I think there's been a lot of staff level of discussions, and I assumed along the way it had been back before, been back before this board since then, but apparently not. Um, so to bring board members up to speed, this is just up uh, Gorham Road, just past the schools and library. Um, and so as board members may recall, may not since it's been so long, uh, quite a bit of the conversation that staff has had has really been around the coordination of the site and the development of the site with the Gorham Road Improvement Project that's occurring or going to occur shortly, we hope. Um, and I, I think Angela will sort of chime in on a couple of those elements here shortly. Um, but just to sort of bring the board up to speed on that. Um, couple, so you have received staff comments as well as comments from Woodard and Kern and Goral Palmer, uh, peer review on the item. Um, so a couple of the elements that we'll want to touch on, as I said, I think Angela might dig in a little deeper on some of these. Uh, we talked quite a, bit, a little bit about site access at the sketch plan. Um, typically, as board members will note, our site plan standards typically seek to minimize the number of curb cuts on a lot, uh, minimize it to one cut. Um, there's two existing cuts on the site, and the applicant's proposing to maintain two cuts um, and really looking at ways to minimize the impacts um, on the overall Gorham Road uh, improvement project and and their uh, influence on that. So I think there'll be some discussion around that moving forward. Um, and obviously as part of this project, as you've noted, there's quite a bit of parking expansion um, and really understanding the parking needs and demands of the site uh, will be critical for the board as part of this review. As we noted during the last review, and I'm sure board members experienced, currently there's, uh, on Sundays, there's uh, often parking along Gorham Road, which there's a nice adequate uh, uh, width to do that currently, but with the uh, redesign meeting our, uh, our, our new, um, or not new anymore, but our complete streets policy and sort of the orientation of the, the improvements that is going to be minimized moving forward. So really being sure there's adequate parking both on site and I know they have some coordination with uh, the library facility. So just uh, having further discussion about that. Um, staff also noted um, that there seems to be some uh, uh, conflicts between some of the existing landscaping and, and uh, some of the stormwater BMP um, elements as well as the snow storage. So just want to be sure we're talking through those and understanding that. Um, and in terms of the building, one of the, the, the applicants are proposing to use metal siding, which you know uh, our, our standards typically seek to, to discourage, however, um, is permitted, provided sort of a high quality, not a very reflective metal. So just want to be sure the board is um, you know, really does, uh, as I'm sure you will, a, a thorough review of the detailing there. Um, and I think the only other thing I want to mention is, and again, uh, I'm sure Angela will touch on this, that um, we talked about how Millbrook crosses this property, at least the corner of the property, and that is uh, on the DEP's threatened streams mm -hmm. list. And so we just need, want to be mindful of that. Um, should note, we did receive an email from the applicant today that had their DOT permit um, attached, so they have received that. And I guess maybe um, just clarity around where they stand with DEP would be good going forward as well. So um, I'll maybe turn it to Angela at this point, if she has anything she wants to highlight. All right. Um, I guess I just wanted to chime in with the majority of staff stormwater comments. Um, it was really just... I think minor in nature, 
but I just wanted to highlight really the focus is on that front under drain soil filter. And, and the only reason I kind of highlighted is that it's really tight. And so with minor things, I just want to make sure that we have the details nailed down tight. Um, as Jay mentioned, Millbrook is, is right there. Um, we also have, you know, obviously the coordination with Gorham Road, and you can see our, I'm looking at my screen, but the multi-use path that we're, we're proposing. Um, and then also I mentioned in the comments about the ability to get to the, and maintain the outlet control structure, which is on the, on the Millbrook side, on the Brook side of that, so farthest away from the parking lot. And so when you factor in um, these, you know, steeper grading, it's, it's tight in there and to be able to say how wide is the berm, how you're going to get over to that structure to, to maintain it in the future. And like I said, each one, each piece is really minor element, but because there's no flexibility in the field when we're constructing this to say, oh, we're going to move this a foot here or, you know what I mean? There's, we really need to nail down and make sure that detail and the elevations associated on the details and matching the grading and that we have adequate access around the, around the forest, or they do to make, to properly maintain the system. Thank That's you. Thank you very much. My name is Tom Greer from Walsh Engineering. Uh, with me tonight is uh, Pastor Samuelson. What I'd like to do is first give you an overview of where we are in the process from our point of view. I'll then go through some of the site issues that we've made and changed and walk you through that. Um, and then I'm going to play architect for a little bit and go through some of the architectural comments that were made. And then Pastor Samuelson will walk you through some of the operations that the church is going to go through to manage the parking, which I think is, is one of the important features of it. Uh, what I've shown here on the board is the existing conditions here. Our site is this uh, green area in through here. Uh, this is the existing building, and we have the two entrances off Gorham Road. You can come in and make a loop and park. Uh, there's a little bit of a, a play area in the back of it. The front of the site is uh, open grass, and what we have next door is uh, Steve Berg's property with some residential housing here, as well as some residential housing over in this location. Uh, this is the mill brook that uh, Angela talked about coming through here. We also have a drainage swale that runs back through here, and they combine here and then wind their way to the north and through that area. This is our overall site plan. Um, what we're adding is uh, a little over 13,000 square foot building in the front. Uh, it, it obviously is much larger than the existing building. Uh, this has been a church site for multiple years uh, with different, different denominations, and the uh, Rock Church has been extremely successful here. And we're very pleased to, that they're here, and we think they can become a, uh, uh, even a more contributing uh, um, entity to the community. Um, what we're looking at is having, keeping the two entrances and coming in here. Uh, as Angela noted, we do have a DOT permit, and that was based on having the two entrances. Um, what happens on Sunday morning is that with a single entrance, um, if, if you have all the cars coming from this direction down and turning in here, it makes a longer queue over on this side of the, of the road, way, making people wait. So with the narrower um, road that's being proposed for Gorham, then this, this ends up being a longer queue. By having these cars turn in here, then more cars can turn in this location and it shortens the queue up. So from a traffic point of view, um, there is less queuing on 114 with the two entrances, and that was really the motivating factor for DOT to provide the permit. So we think that's uh, a waiver that the board should be able to support uh, pretty handily. Um, we do have uh, shown on here, this is the um, improvements that will be made. The 10-foot wide uh, pathway that comes down through swings in a little bit in here and works its way back. When we went to the Zoning Board of Appeals, uh, we have a setback variance in this location, so we're a little closer to uh, the right-of-way, which actually steps back in this location, and we have that. That's a driving factor for us. Um, we have to start construction by June 12th, which was noted in the, in the staff comments. Um, we need to have a DEP permit in place. 
based on my conversation today with Bob Green, it looks like that's going to happen near the end of November, 1st of April. Uh, our plan is to respond to staff's comments um, and submit so that we can be on the April agenda. And hopefully the DEP permit will be in place at the same time. That will give us enough time to get the building permit in place and then start digging on January, uh, June 11th. So everything, it works out. So with, with your cooperation, that's where we would like to be. Um, obviously tonight we're not going to get a vote from the board, but we would like to get enough feedback from the board that if there are any outstanding issues that the staff hasn't brought up, that we can certainly bring those back to the board. Um, as I'll, I'll continue walking my way through here, this existing pa parking right in here will remain, um, and then um, what we're doing is we're expanding the parking out into this location, and then down along this side, we're expanding it over here. Uh, we've worked with our neighbor, Steve Berg. He's been uh, uh, very kind to the, to the church and sees this as a, as a, a great amenity to his, to his little neighborhood in here. Um, he's allowed us to have a 15-foot easement over here um, and put landscaping in through here to buffer the tree, buffer the area in this area and through here. Um, those trees were put together by his landscape architect and what he's looking to put in there, uh, and we're comfortable with them. Uh, it's part of the agreement that we'll put them in and maintain them. Uh, we do have uh, stormwater issues. Um, this is a redevelopment project, as was noted a little earlier on one of the other applications, uh, and we're treating, uh, I think, roughly 62 or 3 percent of the stormwater runoff. We're doing it in an underdrain soil filter in here, which is the dark green area, and a split underdrain soil filter in here, which is, again, the, the dark green area. This one treats most of the water in the back, essentially all of this area. And this one here treats uh, roughly half of this roof and this parking in here. What we've tried to do is um, use our allocation of stormwater treatment for parking areas, which we think are the highest and best used to put treatment systems on versus treating uh, roof water. So that was the, the guiding factor here. Uh, this one here, since you last saw it, We've pulled back all of the parking that was in this area so that we had a 75-foot setback from the stream, which is in this location here, uh, and a minimum of a 25-foot buffer from the stream to the toe of the slope. Um, we've detailed this embankment here um, to be four feet wide with a little crest on it just to get the height on it. So uh, I think the peer reviewer thought it was two feet wide. It actually isn't. It's actually four feet wide. Um, it's a little wider in that area. Um, Controlling the peak flows, leaving the site uh, was extremely difficult, putting that model together and making it work. And when you look at the outlet structures we have, uh, the grade differences, because they're so flat, we're hard to make all that work. And I think we've, we've done that with where we are. We will likely move this overflow from here, um, possibly out closer to the um, edge of the right-of-way, where it might have a little bit better of access. But the, um, outlet will still remain in the same location, which is the low spot on the, on the overall area. So we think we've, we've, we can address that comment without, without much of an issue. Um, we do have one of the other comments raised was this dead-end parking in through here. Um, and what we'll do is we'll strike one of these uh, at the end, no parking, so that you can turn around in that space in the event that, that um, the, the lot is full. We don't believe this is going to happen very often, uh, that, that this is going to be full, and then we'll get into this situation. This is as far away from the, the chapel as, as it can be. We think that's going to be the last used parking spaces. Uh, people will, will circulate in here enough to hopefully find empty spaces, and uh, uh, the pastor will go through some of the, the management uh, aspects of that. Um, going through this quickly through the memo, uh, we will put guardrail around these to keep, keep cars out of there. Um, there is a couple of bike racks that we put in here uh, along this, this walkway. Uh, those are detailed on uh, C2.4 already. Uh, under the stormwater management, we went through some of the uh, elevations here, and we're changing the detail sheet so that the detail sheet reflects what's on the plan sheet just to make those, those work out. Um, and we'll add the town's note, uh, stormwater management note, to the, to, the, to the overall plan. So we think we're in pretty good shape there. 
Uh, as part of our package, we've provided a draft of an agreement to allow the town to come on site uh, and maintain it in the event that it's not maintained as part of their normal um, process, town's normal process. Um, and we'll add some additional erosion control over in this location and through here uh, to, uh, as requested by Wooden and Kearns, Lawrence Sweat's uh, memo went through there. So, so we think we can address all of the staff comments uh, reasonably well. Um, what I'd like to do is talk a little bit. about the elevations of the building here. Uh, these are four perspectives that I think were in, in, in the package in here. Uh, as you're coming uh, uh, down from Oak Hill, uh, we'll have this uh, stone piece here that will, again, sets the tone for the rock church. Uh, and we're looking for um, block letters here on the side of the building. You'll see that on both sides, uh, this, this coming from the opposite direction. You'll see that on both sides. That's the signage that we're looking to do. I think it's uh, very classy. Uh, it's block letter signing near the top of the building and, and sets the tone without having a lot of um, uh, fanfare to it. Uh, it will be lit from above. Uh, we'll have some lights from above that will shine down on the, on the, on the sign itself. Um, the building itself will have a little bit of metal siding in here. Uh, according to the architect, it will be a gray metal siding with a satin finish to it. It will not be a shiny finish. It will be a satin finish so that it won't be reflective. Um, and he thinks that was appropriate for the use. Uh, given the size of the building and the light, he felt that that, that material was appropriate in that location. The other issue that came up was um, uh, HVAC systems and where those are located. Those will be located on the roof. Um, this is the uh, front of the building here, and as you work your way back, this is the existing building. You'll note that the roof in the front is taller in this location, and then it drops down between the two buildings. The HVAC systems will sit in this location in here and will be uh, screened from the road by the top elevation. So we think they're, they're tucked out of sight and they're in a, in a place that uh, we can access them from below with a, with a roof hatch and that they're, they're really out of sight from a, from a design point of view. Uh, I thought that was just great from uh, a design point of view that that Dwight had come up with that. You can see on the opposite side elevation, uh, it fits in this, this square in here is where the HVAC systems will be, be placed. We're, we're not only, there are two now that are on each side of the existing building. Those are getting removed and we'll, we'll have uh, new systems or those will be relocated up to here to service both the existing building and the new building. So there'll be no ground mounted um, HVAC systems. So we're, we're pretty comfortable with that. Um, um, uh, the public utilities, we have sent the uh, package to the sanitary district and are awaiting a response back from them, as well as to the Portland Water District. They had asked us to make a minor change to the um, service, and we've done that, but we have not sent it back to them, but we expect that to, to come back to us fairly shortly once we, once we get it to them. With that, I think I've covered most of the issues in the staff memo. I'll let uh, the pastor talk about uh, parking and how that's going to work. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Eric Samuelson, and I have the privilege of being a pastor at the Rock Church, and I'm very thankful to be with you all tonight. I can't believe that Tom handed off the podium to a pastor with six minutes left on the clock. That's the uh, biggest mistake ever. Um, no pastor ever talked that short. So I'll make my comments extremely brief, realizing that the clock uh, is ticking because I'd love to have any inputs that you have for us. I want to thank Tom for exceptional work uh, with civil plans. And so my part is to um, preempt or to discuss parking plan and off-site parking procedures. And ultimately what the church realizes is with the Gorham Road improvement, which we love being a part of that, I truly feel that all of this expansion along with Gorham Road improvement really provides Scarborough uh, with a church that I hope is a bit more worthy of the community that's already created here. 
As we expand the building and partner with Gorham as the Gorham Road Improvement, our goal in all of this has been to create a balanced facility. And balanced means that the parking is the right size for the number of seats, is the right size for the amount of fellowship and transition areas, and right size for the amount of classrooms. Uh, we in no way would want to create a facility that's too big for the parking lot or a parking lot too big for the facility. So uh, what we've created in terms of the number of spots that Tom's been able to bring together both with civil plans and our site and our partnership with our neighbor is a site where we have enough parking spots for the seats that we have in the facility when the facility's full. Uh, that's in detail of the, the long version of text that I gave to you, but we run a 2.1 um, people to car ratio, and churches don't fill, you can't fill every seat in a church. People need places to put their coats, um, their space as people comfortably sit. And so those 269 seats provide enough parking for all of our regular use. The only time that we would need to move to an expanded or an off-site parking plan is when you're having a special event, uh, perhaps some of those absolutely full days like holidays or things like that that provide. You all know that churches don't run full week to week or day to day or event to event. Uh, but for those special events, that's when we would begin to activate or possibly need off-site parking. And uh, what we've done to this point is we've just worked with the community and we've worked with our neighbors. If it's a few cars, if it's anything uh, up to about 20 cars or so, uh, we tend to first communicate with the library. A lot of times we're open when they're not, and so we have an agreement uh, to work with Nancy Crowell at the library, to work off-site parking if it's a few spots. If that's not available, uh, then we go to Scarborough Community Services. Um, those parking spots and use of facilities, community facilities, are available through the website. If those are available, we'll coordinate there. And then, of course, we have the neighbors at Hannaford and uh, some ability for some overflow parking there. And so we've worked with each of those different agencies throughout. Um, the real answer on parking for us is we know that Gorham Road will not be available for parking, so we won't park cars on Gorham Road. If the parking lot is full and we don't have access to off-site facilities, that's when our facility is full. So there may be an empty seat or two within the building, um, but the parking lots are full, and so that would be when the facility is full. If off-site parking is available, then maybe there are a few days a year where we might maximize the use of every seat. But churches don't function at every seat full. They function at, you know, ideally up to 80% full, but even that uh, is a great day for a church. So those are kind of my initial comments on parking, um, use of the property and facility, and I think um, Tom alluded well that our goal is to take care of every person. And so even when you get to some of the things like what would a full parking lot be like, those are times where we provide parking teams, parking attendants. Uh, they're out there with vests, wands, cones, uh, helping guide people into spots and helping guide people out of spots. So even the concerns that were addressed earlier today about um, the, the dead end parking type areas and concerns that might be raised quickly about that, um, one, we're kind of um, single floor direction. Everybody's showing up at the same time reason leaving at the same time so you don't have kind of head-to-head -head conflicts but the other thing is in a scenario where our lot would be completely full that's where we provide attendance and people that provide that service of helping people in and out or physically guiding traffic uh, to make sure those flow throughs happen so those are my initial comments be happy to answer any questions thanks so much that we'd be happy to answer questions and Hopefully, take comments. Thank you very much. Um, we do have an opportunity for some public comment this evening. So, if there is anyone here that would like to speak to this, please step to the podium. Public comments are open. Seeing none, I will close public comment. And we will jump into this. Roger. <coughs> um, Okay, uh, first, um, I like the architectural drawings of the, the church. I think it really looks nice. It'd be a nice signature building right there on that area. Um, there's, um, I understand um, Angela's concerns regarding where, where that con control structure is and everything, and I have confidence you'll work that out. <laughs> The only um, other thing I had is I couldn't see where you had, what do you do with snow removal? Yeah, the snow removal is tricky on a site like this. Um, we're going to end up with snow being plowed just like you'd see it plowed in any other piece. It's, it's very likely to get, get placed along this, this edge here, uh, this edge in the back, and we're going to end up with some around the outside edge here. 
Some of that may be in conflict with the landscaping. Our feeling is that, that we're going to have to maintain the landscaping and we may have to remove snow from the site um, if you get a big snow year. Um, if we get 60 degree days in January and February, um, we get a break. But other than that, we're, we're likely to have to remove some of the snow. Okay. Um, that, that's all I have right now. Thank you. Okay. Yeah, uh, I noticed uh, among the comments that the staff had, um, they talk about a dead end parking area and that you had indicated that the spaces would only be used when absolutely necessary. Do you right. intend to somehow rather block them off or only open here. them up? Yeah, uh, what we'll do is we'll, we'll take one of these spaces here at the end and we'll stripe it no parking, turn around space and, and do that. Uh, but it, that's not quite what I asked. The, you noted that the spaces would only be used when absolutely necessary. Yeah, these, these are as far away from the use as possible, so they're very likely to be the last space, spaces used. So, so you're not going to take any active moves Correct. to block them off until, until needed? Correct. If, 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 if there are open spaces in here and someone wants to park there simply because they want to park as far away as they can, then, then they're certainly welcome to do that. They'll probably be there alone, but, but that's what we're looking to do. Okay. Um, I was wondering if you could, uh, at the next meeting, bring samples of the, um, uh, the metal, the metal siding that you're going to be using so we can, we can look at it. I, I'll ask the contractor. We do have a contract all lined up and ready to go, so uh, that may be possible. Good. I'd, I'd like to see that, if you, if you could do that. Okay. Uh, and then I have a, a question that's a little bit, I guess, out of the scope, but um, I notice that the architecture of the old building and the architecture of the new building doesn't exactly match. Nope, they don't. Uh, is there any thought in the future of bringing them into some sort of harmony, either by the painting or by some renovations? Or? I'll let the pastor do okay. that. He's the one with the checkbook. So <laughs> So the short answer to your question is no, we do not have an intention to try to bring uh, that back portion of the property forward or to match it. Uh, what we have created is the entryways along Route 1 that create a, a very nice glassed appearance. Right now we have unfortunately uh, a pyramid with no doors that faces Route 114, which is an incredibly unappealing facing. I feel, I really do feel like we don't represent the community as well as we'd like to. Um, when this is created, it, it's true as you can even see here at some angles, you can see the back end of that building, but most of the views, both from the street and in passing, uh, will only be of what we feel is a significantly improved structure. So the short answer is we do not intend to. Uh, and I do believe that some of the landscaping, and especially as you see it um, when you're coming from Sam's Club and heading towards um, the center of Scarborough and Route 1, you can see that a lot of landscaping design already covers some of that back area. All right, that's all I have. Thank you. Rick. All right. I wish our stormwater expert was here. <laughs> this is just a lot of impervious surface. Yes, it is. Um, and it's a fairly flat lot, if I recall. So, um, but your your plan looks sufficient uh, for the stormwater. Um, it's just interesting to to try to figure out how it's going to flow sure. in the right direction. But I'm yeah, um, right now what what we have is. Um, the, the building sort of creates a high spot right through here with the, with the ridges so that this flows this way and from right about in here, all of this flows down to Route 1 across the ditch that's there now and then over to the, yeah. to the piece here. This back piece here, um, we're keeping this high spot here and a high spot here and this comes down into this underneath soil filter. We've sort of broken, broken it into two sections so that we can collect this section in this, this bay and then this area in through here all flows down through here and we collect we collect it in a um, in this bay in here to, so to treat it those reservoirs are going to be sufficient for no, there's not going to be a lot of water running off the lot right 
well, it, these overflow to a swale that runs down through here. And this one overflows to this swale that runs down through here. Um, there, there is, what we've done is design them so they capture enough water to keep the peak flows the same as, yeah. as was originally talked about. And that um, the first inch of runoff gets infiltrated through the underdrain soil filters. So that goes through the, through the filter itself, picked up in underdrains, and then discharged in this location. So 80% uh, of the storms are small storms. All of those will get captured in here. The water will sit in there from 24 to 48 hours. Uh, it infiltrates through the, through the grass uh, basin, and then it will discharge out down below. When you get a storm that's bigger than a, than a one-inch rainstorm, you'll begin to see some of it overflow through the outlet structure and the, and the riprap overflow in both of them. And obviously, when you get very big storms, uh, a three-inch rainstorm and above, you get, you get the majority of the storm will be overflowing, but at, but at the rate that's, that's there now. Um, as far as your photometric uh, I saw your lights, they all look good. Yeah. Um, are you going to be, because there's residents and you're not doing much at church at night, are you demoing those at, at a certain time? Yeah, those will all be um, controlled, um, both with the photometrics on and then a, t a timer off <coughs> or manually on and off, depending on the event that the, that the church may be running. For instance, they run a, a Thursday night service uh, late. Um, they're likely to be on later Thursday night than they are any other night during the week. So they're actually going to shut them off at night? No, there will, there will be some of them will be shut off, um, but there will be some lights that will be left on for security lights and driving around and that type of thing. Typically what you would see at a, at a commercial. Do you think about just dimming them at all, or is that a reason you wouldn't want to do that maybe? I don't know. I, I can talk to the electrical engineer to see if that's possible, um, but um, we might, this, this, they're designed to the current standards, which is not a lot of light for a parking lot there, you know, maximum of two foot candles and, and, and the like. So um, they're right. not real bright to begin with. Okay. I just thought with the neighbors around, you probably yeah. want to try to be as. Yeah. What, what are your plans for during construction? Because I mean, a lot of the projects we see here are new construction. I mean, you're obviously going to be holding services for. Yes. Are you going to try to? Yeah, you want to try sure. to? I mean, how are you going to? So obviously there's no change to our attendance or current parking needs during any of the construction and expansion. And so it's a, it's a use of um, creating, creating areas where the right Ryan would need uh, staging areas and things like that by, say, expanding out the parking long before we need it uh, so that we can put cars over here and right Ryan can do staging here where we still have the same number of cars functioning that we do now with our smaller seating area. So we're able to manage, because we're gonna have a lot more surface footprint to either park cars or to stage construction vehicles and uh, construction equipment and materials, we're able to maintain our normal services in our current small building, um, move parking as required to allow construction to happen. Okay. Does that make sense? It, it does, I was just wondering if there were gonna be more cars out there. No, so there won't be. Uh, we will maintain, and right now we're at the place, we did a very small expansion uh, to the back part of our parking lot, and right now we have zero need uh, to put any cars off-site at any time. So, and that's what you've seen for the past. That was only completed back at the end of November, uh, but that's what you've seen from the church since November. Okay. So, uh, that's already in effect, and that will remain that way. We don't expect to use 114 again. Okay. But we can, it's legal, but we don't expect to. Just to the lighting thing, right now we turn our lights off every night. Obviously, there's some door and entryway lighting that's maintained, that yeah. kind of security and entryway lighting. That must be on the actual parking lot lights. We do turn off at night. And unless there's a town ordinance, we would probably continue to turn off the lot lights, just maintain kind of facility and access lighting for safety. Yeah, that's yeah. fine. That's good. Yeah, that sounds good. All right, um, I like the design. I think it looks nice, and I think it does add to the community, and I'm glad to see that you're that's all I got. Thank you. So, um, I think most of most of what I had here listed has been covered or addressed one way or another. Um, I did see that you had a waiver request um, for a parking aisle from 25 feet down to 22 feet. Um, I 
I don't see any issue with that from okay. my perspective. Um, you know, I think you, you know, what's interesting about this is we, because of your expansion, um, it, it looks like you've tried to obtain as much parking as you can on the site. Is that fairly accurate? Yes, every square inch that every we square could. Inch of it, the right? only thing we didn't do was put these underground. Um, but other than that, that's, that's right. where we are. Um, and and so, you know, with that said, I mean, there's a lot of impervious surface there. Um, I think continuing to work with Angela and the town, making sure that your stormwater management plan's ready to roll and uh, yeah. I'm in good shape is going to be very important to this project. Um, as far as the architecture of it, um, you know, it's it's striking. It's a striking building. And so I think um, I think people are definitely going to, they're going to notice the impact it has on the community and, and the way it it's going to have an appearance just on 114 in general. So, great. Um, Thank you. You know, it's 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 going to be uh, it's going to be great to see you go up. Um, I don't have a whole lot else. Did I miss anything that staff needs information on? For and likewise, are you looking for anything from the planning board that we haven't uh, addressed in some some fashion? I, I don't think so. I think we've covered most of the issues. We're going to answer the staff questions. Um, um, we hope to be back here um, in April and hopefully we have all of the ducks in a row so that we can get approval and that keeps us on schedule. I guess there were just a couple of things that came up in discussion that might be good just to have uh, some details moving forward about recognizing where you're talking about putting the roof mounted HVAC systems. Yeah. Um, understand, you know, I think if you're looking straight on from Gorm Road, clearly it'll be screened. Just sort of wonder how how well those will be screened as you're coming down 114 or up 114, where you do sort of get the elongated view. So it might be helpful if your renderings could depict what that looks like. And yeah. If, um, yeah. Uh, yeah. I think. Uh, see how these little wings stick out? Yep. They, they they really end up being right here in the middle of the building. Mm -hmm. So there's a there's a fair amount of building in the way depending on, on when, you, when you're looking in this direction before you can see them. But we'll get Dwight to uh, add those to his, his plans and, and show at least a box as to what they're going to look like. They're, they are fairly good-sized units. To, right, and, and that's to, sort of what I was saying. I, I would yeah. imagine these are going to be pretty big units, and so they are. sometimes if they're perfectly shielded, buffered, that's fine. Our standards just say if they're rooftop mounted, be sure they're, they're buffered. So, you, you know, some buildings we have, you know, they have some... Uh, modest screening up, so just be mindful of where where that exactly is going to be located, and if it can be shielded and is yep. shielded by the building, all the better. I'm not looking for you to do anything that sure. doesn't need to be there. Um, I did hear just around the lighting. I think what your proposal is makes uh, a world of sense. As Rick said, you are in the R4 district, which is a residential district, um, so I think it would be worth putting a note on the on the plan set itself, just about your or your lighting plan that you will turn off lights. Obviously, security lights, you know, I would just, you know, we can work on what that note says, but just so it's very clear moving forward. And then the only question I would have to the board is, are you interested in seeing the construction phasing plan, or is that something you'd be comfortable with staff? That's something we would work through probably as part of the pre-construction process, just to say, all right, you know, where, where, where are the guys, go, you know, where's the construction trailer going to be and all the materials going to be, and how are we going to maintain the right amount of parking? Is that something the board wants to see, or is that something you're comfortable with uh, staff working on moving forward down the line? I'm comfortable with staff handling that aspect of the management. Okay. Okay. Yeah. yeah. I trust her. <laughs> we'll, we'll get we'll get right Ryan to put together a yeah. sketch or something for that. So we can do that as part of the pre-construction. Yeah. So yeah. Es essentially, what I see happening is this this back bay of parking in here and this bay in here are going to get are going to get built just as quick as we can up front to give us some extra parking area, even if it's gravel. And then, uh, and then with that, we'll be able to really shift people around wherever we need them. And, uh, and just so I can chime in, um, there's going to be a lot of coordination anyway, because starting in July, um, uh, and I know you start, you're talking about starting in June, obviously Unitil's coming through and doing some some of their work through Gorham Road. I mean, this is going to be a big construction zone for quite some time. So there's going to be a lot of coordination with that yeah. in the sequence of that is, yeah. Yeah, and I think we can do that. Obviously, we need to do that all across the front here, whether it's the underdrain soil filter or just the, just the storm drain itself, you know, and to make that work. 
And uh, what I anticipate is we'll likely have either, we'll, we'll have weekly staff meetings and the staff, the, the town will be invited to those. So if they want to come, great. If they don't, they don't. If it looks like there's going to be an issue, they can attend. If not, that type of thing. That would be good. Okay. Well, thank you very much. Thank you very much. I appreciate it. Good evening. So we are now past 1030. So we cannot take up any new items this evening. Um, for anyone that has showed up um, to, to comment on that, uh, appreciate you being so patient and taking the time to be here. Um, uh, yeah, and we appreciate that. But this is a. Uh, this is a, a large topic. We know it. We've been through two of them. Um, and I'm not sure uh, with a minimized board that we should be tackling it uh, post 1030. So, um, again, thank you for coming out.